You can't make it, so there's no lecture at 10 on Monday. Uh, now it's good luck for your final. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so the thing from a panel talk will be simple theories and simple groups. And I stress the word simple is being used in two completely different ways reacting that modern day meaning and a group theory meaning. Um, so I talked a little bit yesterday about stable theories. I, I did give a, a combinatorial definition of stability. It was essentially the definition for a formula. They were saying a formula is unstable if you get this sort of picture. It's a formula that defines this sort of picture. Um, there's a similar, more complicated definition for a formula um, witnessing not being simple. Which I, will just, I will just give you the definition, it's not terribly enlightening, but just, just so you see a definition of a simple theory, I'll start with that. So we have, a, we have a complete theory T. So think of that as the collection of all sentences true of some structure, say it. And then the definition, so the formula phi xy, so two lots of variables, two tuples of variables, has the tree property. And this is all with respect to theory T. If, this is not, this is not terribly enlightening in a way, but for some k, some natural number k, the following holds. So maybe before I write it down, I'll just draw a picture. The intuition is that, is that we draw a, a tree of height omega and oh, height, yeah, over natural numbers, and infinitely branching, where vertices, nodes, are indexed by instances of the formula phi. So here you'll have, say, phi xa0, phi xa1, and so on. And as you go up the tree, we will witness, uh, the index for a will be a finite sequence of natural numbers. And then the idea is that if you go up a branch, the collection of all the formulas labelling the, the, the vertices will be a consistent collection. But if you look immediately above any vertex, the labels of these will be k inconsistent. So any collection of k of them is inconsistent. That's the idea. So you've got some sort of um, well, it, I mentioned in the discussion of yesterday dividing. You're also sort of dividing going on at each stage. You're consistent among the branch. So that's the picture to have in mind. So formally, um, there are uh, parameters a eta in there. And I really mean these could be tuples of parameters for all finite sequences eta. I write this as eta in omega to a less than omega. So a finite sequence of natural numbers, <coughs> such that for each eta, the set of formulas phi x a eta followed by i, i know again, is k inconsistent. K inconsistent. So that's saying that at each stage, this is K inconsistent. So this is eta followed by naught, eta followed by y, followed by two, and so on. And then, and for each sigma, that's now an infinite sequence of natural numbers. The collection of its restrictions is consistent. So the collection of all formulas, phi x, a, eta, where eta restricts sigma, is consistent. 
So that's saying that if you go up a branch, it's consistent. <coughs> yeah. So does k inconsistently, if you take any k statements, that, that's an inconsistency? That's right. So, so, so it means in the model of the theory, you're not going to have an x witnessing it. But we think of all these parameters as chosen inside. We think of, it, of m as being some big model of t, if we have inside m. And you've got a gamma there, but there's no gamma. Look, gamma, I can't see a gamma. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a sigma. sigma. That's a sigma. Uh, it's a restricted sigma. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I don't want to linger too much on that definition. But anyway, uh, T is simple um, if no formula. That's the tree property. It's, it's unfortunate terminology, a rather involved definition, if you say it's simple. Uh, but anyway. Um, so we'll take that as definition of simple, and then, just as stability did, this gives a notion of independence on subsets of the model. So this gives a notion of independence of the form A independent from B over C. A is independent from B over C. It's almost as good as the independence you get in stable theories. The, there's one, one real difference, and that is, in a stable theory, Suppose you have, say, let's say, an element A and the C and B. Then, if you know this information, and you know what A looks like over C, then you know what A looks like over B. There's essentially a unique way this can happen. So the information of A over C determines A over B. It's called stationarity. You don't have that in, in general in simple theories. Something like the random graph. This breaks down. <coughs> okay. <coughs> There's a sp I'm actually going to be working with a slight strengthening of simple. Um, so T is super simple. Uh, this, this means if simple and, well, given, say, a triple A, all inside our <laughs> big model, and some set B. Um, there is finite C inside B, such that A is independent from, from B over C. So you can find a, a small set of which A is independent. Again, it's hard to unravel what that's saying. What it, what it gives you is a nice ordinal valued rank on definable sets. So this gives a nice ordinal valued rank on definable sets. But that's sort of the relevant part. I mean, in fact, it's a rank, it's a rank both on types and dependable sets, but I'm focusing on, on dependable sets. Uh, yeah? Could you explain why uh, stable implies simple? Uh, okay, so, so the question is how, out of, it, uh, out of uh, this picture, or that picture, yes. you would get that picture. Can we keep that the afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Right now, I'll go instantly. This starts off. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks.
Okay. So, to get back to something pretty much I break, um, the theorem, which I think should be to, there's a paper of Shatidakis, Van der Vries, and McIntyre, which <coughs> not what I'm saying comes back to that, so I'll come back to it in a moment. The theorem says that pseudo finite fields are <coughs> super simple. Of rank one. So it's a it's sort of generalization of the fact that algebraically closed fields are stable, in fact, are strongly minimal, meaning that any definable set is finitely co finite. I haven't actually mentioned that before, but any definable set in zero complex numbers is finitely co finite. This is a sort of generalization of that. As a corollary, you get that uh, corollary with something feeding into it. Actually, um, I guess <coughs> there's quite a bit feeding into it in the case of Suzuki regroups. Is that um, simple pseudo-product groups so this is simple in the group theory sense there are no normal subgroups, no subgroups, no subgroups, no normal subgroups, <coughs> um, are modeled theoretically super simple of finite rank. <coughs> so we have John Wilson's theorem, which tells you that simple pseudophilic groups are which is Lee type, possibly twisted, over pseudo-finite fields. We know pseudo-finite fields are nice, and this gets inherited by the groups, essentially because you can interpret the groups in the fields, you can define the groups in the fields, and that preserves simplicity. The rank maker, just as you know, SL2 is, is naturally a, a rank 3 object, for example, as you can expect it to be, because there are three degrees of freedom. Um, I'm pushing one thing under the carpet here, which I'll come back to, which is with the Suzuki and regroups, where you don't interpret those just in the field. You interpret them in a field equipped with an automorphism, so with a, with a symbol for an automorphism. And one needs to know that that richer theory is also super simple of rank one. And that follows from a pretty deep paper of I'll just try to give you a hint of what this rank is about. Um, there's a rank on definable sets. I won't say too much about it, but the sort of basic problem is you might want for, for a rank so that if a set gets larger, the rank can't get smaller, so multiplicity. Um, the rank will be zero if and only if x is finite. And just to sort of get a feeling for how I might behave with groups, uh, if, say, n is normal in G and definable, then you're going to have the, the rank of G equals the rank of n plus the rank of G over n in this finite rank situation. Okay, so, it's, it, so it's, it's something you can work with, you can do induction. As well. Okay. <coughs> I'm sorry? Is it related to asymptotics of size? Yes, it is. I'll, I'll, actually, that's, that's really the next result I come back to. The, the, yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly.
Okay, so I mentioned this theorem of well, this theorem up there, which is essentially Tatsudaki's Van Rees McIntyre. I was mentioned that their their real theorem. Um, so this is Tatsudaki's Van Rees McIntyre. <coughs> 1992. So the result up there follows from this. So this, uh, this is a uniformity statement about sizes of definable sets in finite fields. So we're working in the usual language for, for dealing with finite fields. So the language of rings, so you have plus, minus, times, zero, and one. <coughs> um, so let phi x, y be um, L rings formula, so just natural language for working with rings, and I'll just say that say the length of x, the number of entries of x is n, number of entries of y is n. So then there is a constant c depending just on phi, <coughs> and a finite set D, depending on phi, of pairs D and mu. Well, if you think of D as a dimension, mu as a measure, that's the intuition. So here, um, D is between the natural number between 0 and the number of entries of x, <coughs> x. and mu is a positive rational. Such that for any finite field, FQ, and any um, parameters from that field, any choice of parameters from that field, so the parameters for the y variables. So the point is, you've got a formula in two lots of variables. So this really, gives, in any structure, this gives you a family of definable sets. For each, for each y, for each choice of parameters y, you get a definable set in the x variables. So that's what we're looking at here. So for any a there, <coughs> there is a choice d mu from our finite set, such that well, first of all, the definable set determined by phi and a bar has size roughly mu times q to the d. And secondly, you can define the set of all such y's. So such that, first of all, if you look at the definable set, that's the solutions in fq of our formula phi, when you put in A to the y variables, the size of that, because the difference of that with mu q to the d, that matches the inmost c times q to the d minus a half. So the exponent's gone down to the point here. And, uh, <coughs> and then, okay, so that. And then also, the kind of definability clause, for each pair d mu, for each d mu, in my finite set D phi, I've got a formula which tells you that is that pair D mu which is equal. So there is psi sub D mu of y um, defining the set of such a. Set of such a in each FQ. So this is a kind of definability clause. Maybe it's best to focus mainly on this first condition. So it's saying you're working across all finite fields, you're just fixing a formula phi, and you get finitely many pairs d mu, and any definable set, whatever the parameter, would have, have size roughly mu q to the d for one of those pairs. <coughs> 
this error term. And then, this, then this, this formula tells you which DMU is picked. Okay. Can, yeah. can you show for each individual queue that side you would be a polynomial or then tell something about this polynomial or set you so the side. Uh, so, so how do you mean? So are you are you do you mean how exact is this? Is the lesson topic was exact? Um, I mean it, it has to be in this asymptotic form. Um, and this this comes from the Langley estimates, which have to be in the asymptotic form. But I, I think if you're dealing with Say subgroups of affine algebraic groups, then it would be exact. Uh, but for example, if you deal with elliptic curves, it has to be approximate. You can't take advantage of it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, uh, the, just to get a feeling for what this something sort of might say, it was a question that Felkner asked whether uniformly you can define fq in fq squared. So in the field fq squared, it, well, is there a formula such that in any field fq squared, its solutions are fq? So you kind of think um, it, it should be the, the fixed point set of x goes to x to the q. But there's no formula talking about that map, x to x to the q, because it depends on q. Uh, this, this tells you can't. Because, <coughs> you see, if we're looking for a subset of fq, then x is a single variable, so n is 1, so d is 0 or 1. So any definable subset of fq has size roughly either a positive proportion of the field, so half q or a third of q or something like that, so much bigger than the square root of q, or bounded by a constant. Okay, so it tells you you can't define fq and fq squared. So, I mean, this result would sort of make sense for any class of structures. It would be reasonable. You, you can imagine a definition where you, where you replace finite fields just by structures in some class, some class of groups or graphs or something, and you can apply what this holds. Um, and it's, I did some work with Charles Steinhorn and Richard Elwes around this. And I mean, this is very naturally a one-dimensional condition, in the sense that if, if x is a single variable, so n is 1, then d is going to be 0 or 1. d you should think of as something like a, a dimension. So in that sense, the underlying structure will be dimension 1. It's one-dimensional. There's an n-dimensional version, so it contains the concept of an n-dimensional as another class. Of fire structures. So this came from work of Elwin, myself, and Steinhorn. Um, where it's just a, a class, essentially a class, in, you, you fix some language, it doesn't matter what language, the class of finite structures satisfying the above 
Well, with one, well, it's one major, one, one tweak really, that where the n dimensional condition will be that um, d ranges between 0 and capital N times little n. That's the main difference. We actually make some other slight changes, but essentially that's the main point. <coughs> that corresponds to n dimensional. So it's, it's some collection of fine structures where you have strong asymptotic constraints on size of the sets. So we'll break down. And then <coughs> the theorem is that the theorem of Wrighton is that so let C be a family of finite simple groups. Of fixed lead type. Fixed lead type. So, for example, PSL twos or PSL threes. We we, we we regard the the rank there as part of the type. Um, then C is an n-dimensional asymptotic class. So sorry. So, <coughs> so the, the idea here is that you, you, finite simple groups are sufficiently close to finite fields that uniformly, I mean, it, forgetting for a moment about Suzuki and regroups, it's really straightforward in a uniform way to interpret any class of finite simple groups in the corresponding finite fields. So interpret PSL2 inside FQ in a uniform way. The other direction you can also do, I um, mean, so the idea where you, you get the additive group of the field um, from a unipotent subgroup, must be the group of a torus, so put them together. That's the intuition. It can be done. The, there are issues about the role of parameters, it's a bit tricky. And then there is this issue about Suzuki and regroups, so I want to just mention. That if you're looking, for example, at um, regroups. Um, the form 2f4 uh, to the 2k plus 1, uh, your k parameter, the, these are bi interpretable. So that, uh, they share the same model theory as the fields f goes to f of 2 to the 2k plus 1, equipped with an automorphism x goes to x to the 2 to the k, the power of the Venus. And so if you just work with the field on its own, you can't in a uniform way define the groups. You need to have a symbol for the automorphism as well. And so what was needed was um, an extension of the theorem up there for pseudo-finite field or for finite fields equipped with an appropriate automorphism. So appropriate power for convenience. And this was this was done by Mark Wrighton. Um, so it's handled by uh, Wrighton um, using uh, the Dalton okay. So let's say a bit about sort of what sort of content this kind of result could have proved theoretically. Yeah. But really the rest of the talk will be about application, possible applications or, of this kind of thing to finite simple groups. Or maybe applications are believe too strongly, but different ways of seeing things about finite simple groups. <coughs> so, um, so examples of applications. I think most of the things I say um, would be known or it could be done in another way. But <coughs> so, what about sort of word maps? It's been quite an industry recently. Um, so, 
we fix some non trivial word in the free group. So, w x1 to xc, non trivial word in the free group on the elements. Okay. So, if it has any group G, um, w defines a map. Natural way, uh, G to the D to G. Just, just put in beautifuls in G, you get to that. So, for example, W might be a commutator. Okay. And then we're interested in the image of W. So I'll write, I'll just write WG, just, just a brief um, for the image, the image of W. Okay. So if, if W is a commutator, this would be the set of commutators. So the comment is that once you've fixed the word, this will be uni a uniformly definable map across all groups. <coughs> so in particular, if you look at any class of finite simple groups, it will be uniformly definable given by a single formula. So this kind of statement has information. So, I don't want to be too precise on this, but what it's going to tell you is that, um, so fix the class, I'll call it C sub tau, of finite simple groups of lead type tau and a word W. Um, so, consider the formula. Phi, I guess, x, y, which just says um, w of x equals 1. So here, um, the length of x is d. <coughs> okay, so this, you can, you can apply this uniformity to this. So <coughs> um, then, so the above theorem, then the above theorem. gives uniformity for five of sizes. <coughs> but with this data, giving, giving C tau and W, there are going to be far too many pairs, D mu, such that each fiber has size roughly mu um, size of the group to the D for some pair D mu. So it gives that kind of information. You can like, get more out of this I mean, um, using general methods for the sort of model theory and simple theories. Something that um, I and Catherine looked at. Um, so you, you, you obtain sort of weaker versions of results obtained quite recently. So you obtain um, if G in C tau is larger. <coughs> 
then if you look at the image of the world map, um, okay, <coughs> look at this cube, then that's the whole of G. <coughs> so th this, well, I'm not gonna uh, be too precise about this, but this, this follows from Simplicity in the model theory sense of um, the model theory simplicity of simple superbolic groups. Uh, of course, in that, um, plus a result really of Borel, uh, plus a sort of Borel results for regroup by Larson, but in algebraic, in a simple algebraic group, the word map is dominant. The, um, the image of the word map is called dimension. <coughs> that if G is a um, simple algebraic group, then um, I'll say um, the this this enclosure of, of the image of the word map equals G. <coughs> okay, so I can fairly rapidly obtain, obtain this out, out of this. Um, there are much stronger results known. Um, so the strongest statements of this sort seem um, a series of papers involving Larson, Chalel, and Thiel. Um, So the most general statements um, I think would be um, Larson, Shalev, Tiet, 2013. So this is really for all bilateral groups, not just within the fixed lead type. So you can allow a relaxed lead re ranked to vary, and you can replace three copies of the word by two copies. So um, if G is a sufficiently large, uh, that's with respect to the word, quasi-simple group, quasi-simple, or part uh, group, then W of G times W of G equals G. <coughs> so it's giving a lot more information than the one that they But on the other hand, there's something quite flexible going on here. And all we really needed, we, we needed this <coughs> borel larsen statement. Um, so all we really needed there was that asymptotically in finite groups, the image of the word out of large. So the statement essentially is going to be that um, if the statement is that if, if x is, is definable, in G, you know, in, in G, in our class C2, C2 power. And um, essentially, um, I'll just, let me just, this is slightly, uh, I'll just say dim x equals dim G. So I haven't quite defined. What I mean is that the 
when we look at these pairs d mu, the d, the d is the same for x and g. It's full dimension. Um, just under that situation, then you get that x times x times x equals c. Okay. So it's just it's just that's another information on the size of on the size of x that it's a full dimension, and you have this. Um, and this is also, I guess, closely related to um, a paper a few years ago of Nikolov and Thiebaud, um, who again proves it much stronger in the sense that we need this definability. Um, they work with an arbitrary subset of G of sufficiently large size. And, that, and really a, a general class of groups, not, not just, not just C tau. It's, it's more general in many ways. Um, they do have an extra condition which is kind of mysterious. Um, they, they have an extra condition. They're assuming they're working with a group with no small dimensional non-trivial representation. And so, so that, the, the, there's, there's, they have that input. This has this um, definability input. Uh, I don't mean, quite know how those are related. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's sort of one way in which the sort of modern theory sort of feeds back into finite simple groups. Another thing I wanted to mention around this, um, Gerhardt in his course, that is in the first lecture, talked about the irreducibility theorem for simple algebraic groups. So, for example, if you're working inside a simple algebraic group and take a, an arbitrary product of Irreducible algebraic subgroup, so that will be closed. That kind of statement. Well, there are there are some moderate generalizations to groups in in super simple theories. So there's a theorem, uh, pretty correct, the indecomposability theorem. Um, uh, it's it's Wagner. Um, so it's a sort of successive generalization. I mean, ultimately, it's the Hagrid algebraic groups, which, which then Zilber um, generalized to groups of one and rank. It's a head major tool there. This is a further generalization, really. So it's the following. So let G be a group. G have um, super simple finite rank theory. So like one of these simple pseudo groups. And um, let's take a correct and definable subset. The correction of definable subsets of G. Okay. <coughs> so you, you look at what they generate inside G. Ideally, you'd like to say that what they generate is definable. That's the kind of thing we'd like. We'd like. Um, so then there exists a definable group H, H inside G, such that with two conditions, um, So we want the final group H, which is sufficiently close to the subgroup generated by the XIs. That's the idea.
<coughs> so first of all, um, H is inside the so subgroup generated by the XIs. Um, and <coughs> in fact, it's, it's inside a finite product. So there are um, N and uh, epsilon I equal to plus or minus one and I1 up to IN in I, the data, such that um, actually H is inside this finite product, X I1 to the epsilon 1 times X I N to the epsilon. Okay, so that I guess would be true for the trivial group. Um, but also um, saying that the, the XIs are reasonably large, so each XI mod H is finite. So XI meets just finite in any cosets of H. Uh, so, so uh, right. So that, that's saying H is reasonably large. And there's a, there's a further clause that um, also if the, the collection of all XIs is invariant under some family of defined morphisms, then so is H. Invariant under collection sigma of defined morphisms, like conjugation, for example. So, okay. So, so, if you take your dwarfism to be conjugation by elements of the group G, then H will be a normal subgroup. That's the idea. Okay, so this is just, just working in this context of a super simple finite rank theory, like a pseudo finite simple group. And this then feeds down, it gives you something on finite simple groups. Uh, so, there's a corollary. Again, there's something <coughs> mentioned in an sort of article with, with Katrin. Um, you get that, so let C tau uh, be a family of five simple groups of fixed Lee type. Fixed Lee type tau. And phi xy formula, you know, and I'll just take length of x to be 1. So y can be a typical. So we're, we're, it's a, we're looking at a family of definable subsets of a group. Is that the um, So then, you get that there is some number depending just on tau and phi. So there is <coughs> d, d, phi, and tau, um, such that if you take a group in the class and take parameters, so if, if G is in the class, C tau, <coughs> and A in G is the right length, tuple, and you take the, the set defined by phi using A as a parameter, and X will be phi G A, uh, so it has, it has, is large enough, so that is the size of x at least d. We're just taking a sufficiently large definable set of the simple group. <coughs> then g is a product of at most d conjugates of x and x in I'm pretty sure this, this sort of statement can be seen in lots of different ways, but <coughs> it certainly sort of drops out of, of, of the model theory. Um, essentially, if you had a counterexample to this, if you, if you, if you, so if you'd have a, a collection of larger and larger groups in C tau and corresponding parameters where you needed more and more conjugates, you could st stitch them together by an algebra product, and you'd obtain a simple pseudo group to which you have a counterexample of that theorem. That's the idea. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I don't know really specific applications of this, but there are kind of hints, hints of it in various places. Um, there's paper of Lubotsky on getting expanders from five simple groups, where at some point, I mean, I think I get, a, I get the impression there are different groups of literature going different ways, but at some point, he uses this to show, uh, he uses the fact that from this, uh, you can cover G by a finite product of copies of SL2, that's the idea. That, that um, moves or expands as a result of SL2 to other developmental groups, a fixed lead time. Um, and there's, there's also a paper of Shostakin Pillay, do something like this to recover an old result of the um, the the final thing of the sort I wanted to say, this is a yeah. uh, give an indication of the kind of thing you can do with these arguments. So I just wanted to say a word um, about some work with Martin Liebeck and, and Catherine um, on permutation groups. Um, so on, on finite primitive permutation groups, um, where again you're getting applications of these kinds of arguments. Um, so I guess there hasn't been much here about say primitive permutation groups. So a permutation group G on set X is primitive if there is no proper non-trivial G invariant or G congruence, a G invariant equivalent to I mean, the intuition is that you, you break up permutation groups into primitive either building blocks. So you can answer questions on permutation groups by understanding primitive permutation groups. Don't you want it to be transitive? I'm sorry? Don't you want it to be transitive? That's the sort of Yeah, yeah, so that would be the first step. Sure, sure, certainly. Uh, and then, um, so assuming transitivity, um, G is primitive. If and only if point stabilizers Gx are maximal in G. So it's also about it's very close to understanding maximal subgroups in G. So was a, was also, what we were interested in was understanding, say, pseudo finite primitive combination groups, or let's say more specifically, algebra products of finite primitive combination groups. Algebra products which are themselves primitive. <coughs> so we're lo looking at classes of finite primitive permutation groups where primitivity really is first order, and so it carries through to algebra products. So that's really the, the task. So I'm, to understand classes of finite primitive permutation groups that are uniformly primitive in the right way, so it's definable. And the nice criterion of Higman, of DG Higman, um, so Higman. Um, so <coughs> G acting on X is primitive if and only if um, all orbital graphs are 
are connected. So this is, an orbital graph is just a, um, a graph with vertex set x and edge set uh, a g orbit on x, on, on two element subsets of x. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, in the easy fact. So if you want a class of finite primitive groups which is uniform, which is uniformly primitive, so any algebra will be primitive. What you really need is that this is first order. Now, of course, connectedness of a graph is not first order because paths can be arbitrarily long. So you want to make it a bounded diameter. Um, so, <coughs> so the goal is to understand families of finite primitive groups with a uniform bound. So a uniform bound. Maybe I'll call it a family C sub D. A uniform bound D on the maximal orbital balance. So we're saying all orbital graphs have damage on most D. And but since we did this, we're not very explicitly. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't tell you how to read off what CD is from D, but implicitly we've characterized such families. And in one key case, these kind of considerations played a role. Um, essentially, I mean, essentially, the tool for understanding, some tool for understanding um, finite primitive groups is your Nan Scott theorem, which reduces you to questions about finite simple groups and questions about sort of affine groups, questions about representations. Um, and so I had, had to handle primitive actions of, say, finite simple groups. So there, what you're trying to understand, for example, is finite simple groups. So primitive actions of finite simple groups. In other words, really a pair, finite simple group, and a maximal subgroup. You're looking at that situation. So you're understanding um, pairs. Um, G H, where G is a finite simple group and H is a maximal subgroup. Okay. <coughs> and to say that there's a bound on the orbital diameter is really to say that H is boundedly maximal in G. In other words, um, there's a number of D such that if you add any element of G to H, any other element can be written in length of most D putting in the element of G, G inverse, and elements of it. And that's one of the boundary maximums. Um, and really, the, the, the key result which came out of this sort of, this sort of model theory was that um, structures of this kind, pair, if you, if you fix G from some fixed class of finite simple groups, so it's G reading through C tau, then these pairs have super simple theory. So the group G, together with the predicate for H, has super simple theory in that situation. The only thing you have to rule out is situations of the form, um, say, uh, PSL to P inside PSL to P to the R, where R is large. So, so that, where, say, R is a large prime, you, you get examples of maximum subgroups of this sort. Or subfield subgroups. And so long as you rule out that phenomenon, so you, you, put a, you insert a bound on R, then you get that structures of this sort, so finite simple group together with a predicate for maximum subgroup, um, has this nice theory. So ultra products will be super simple. And I think there's a lot more of that sort one can do. But, um, for example, groups together with <coughs> new irreducible representation under certain situations would have super simple theory. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah. Does it define the classification or not?
yes, the Golden Axe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh, as phrased, as phrased, it's it's relativized to a couple of parts of the truth of the three time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, a known family or something. Sorry? Even that C probably a known family. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So I guess in fact it does it. It, it wouldn't, in fact, depend on the fact. I'm going to use the fact that you use the classification to prove that uh, passing the groups are super simple theory. Right? But, uh, but I think the point is, supposing you're dealing with the PSL2, suppose so you start with that. You would know that the large product was of the form PSL2 to the right field. And you would know that was a super simple field. Yeah. Is there any hope to use model theory to maybe write to the same generality as the Liebig um, as the Liebig Shalaktiv theorem? Direct. What is word max? So the product of the word values or two word values is the whole group? So actually two rather than three. Yeah. Yeah, so it's for all simple groups and not for just down the drum. Right. Um, so if, if, so are, if you're going to all simple groups, so if you're looking at I, one issue is that the model theory of say alternating groups is totally wild. Right. So it's it's kind of hard to as we're discussing out here. It's kind of hard to nail out the references to that. But, it, but it, it's going to be a wild theory. It won't be super simple. Right. So you'd have to. I mean, there are devices for kind of using methods from stability theories, simple theories, in unstable situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kruszowski did this in work on approximate subgroups. But it's conceivable you could do something like that. I don't know. There's also a question of reducing 3 to 2. Um, <coughs> but sure, that, that might be a reasonable thing. Um, that, that might be possible. <laughs> simple to quasi simple, I think, is no problem. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think the method I'm talking about worked fine for quasi simple. Or products of privacy. Other comments, questions? There's the afternoon session two to three or so. Um, also, the abstracts. At the end, there's material for three lecture series at present, and I'll see that for the remaining two, there will also be some material that will get a paper or so shortly. So, it's just a start. Please look at your notes and those things. Ask the speakers by email if you have questions, they should be happy to answer. And, well, I want to thank you all for coming here and thank the speakers, all five of them, for the excellent lectures.